glad to be before you once again on this beautiful Lord's Day. If you would, be turning over to 2 Peter chapter 2. This will serve as our starting text this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> it says there, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now this morning, what I would like for us to do is to take a look mainly at this parenthetical statement of verse 8, and in particular, that word vexed, the word vexed. This particular word comes from the Greek term basanizo, basanizo. And this Greek term is found only 12 times in the New Testament. It is rendered as vexed in our text, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. It is rendered as pained in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, toiling in Mark chapter 6, verse 48, as torment in Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, Mark chapter 5, verse 7, and Luke chapter 8, verse 28. Then it is seen as tormented in Matthew chapter 8, verse 6, Revelation chapter 9, verse 5, chapter 11, verse 10, chapter 14, verse 10, and chapter 20, verse 10. And finally, it is found as tossed in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24. Now, this interesting little word, basanizo, is defined by Strong's to torture, pain, toil, or torment. It's always funny to me to, to see the term being defined by its uses. In other words, that display it. However, we turn to Thayer's to get a better idea of this basanizo. First, it is defined as to test metals by the touchstone. Secondly, to question by applying torture. Third, to torture. Fourth, to vex with grievous pains of body or mind. To torment. And fifth, to be harassed, distressed such as those who at sea are struggling with a strong headwind or of a ship that is tossed by the waves. Another Greek term that I think would be beneficial to understand, or at least define, would be basanos, which is where basanizo comes from. According to theirs, basanos is the touchstone which is also called basinite. In Latin, it is lapis lydius. But this touchstone was used um, on gold and other metals would, and would test them. Secondly, it refers to the rack or instrument of torture by which one is forced to divulge the truth. Thus, it indicates torture, pain, torment, acute pains, and this is usually used of the pains of disease or the torments of the wicked after death. Now we see throughout history that the touchstone would be used primarily to determine the, or the purity of the currency used at that time. Since gold was a common metal used for coins, the ancients would use this basinite rock to test that coin. It would be used similar to how we use a whetstone nowadays. 
or a sharpening stone. We slide the, the blade down that rock partic- specifically to sharpen it. However, if, you've, if you're using the, the rougher side of that stone, you're going to see on a dull blade more metal left behind. So on this touchstone, if the metal being tested actually left a mark, it was found to be legitimate currency. Because after all, metal, specifically gold, the more pure it gets, the softer of a metal it is. However, if no metal mark was left behind, the coin or multiple coins was found to be counterfeit. Thus, a touchstone would be used to determine the authenticity of the metals used. Now, from a different angle, referring again to Basanizo and vexed in general, torment suggests persecution or the repeated inflicting of suffering or annoyance, such as horse or a horse being tormented with flies. Basanizo is in the imperfect tense which clearly conveys the idea of Lot's soul tortured and tormented over and over again and again. His witness or awareness of every lawless deed of the Sodomites was akin to a dagger to his soul. Just when he was recovering from one wave of wickedness, so to speak, another came crashing down upon him. Lot was undoubtedly the most pained man in Sodom. Basanizo is used of literal torture in a judicial examination, although here Peter uses it figuratively to describe the severe mental pain which Lot continued to inflict upon himself. It was this pain which was one proof of his inner righteousness. And we'll show a little bit more of that as we continue through this sermon. But I would like for us to discuss this Different yet interesting word, vexed, which comes from the Greek word basanizo, to have basically the touchstone applied to it. We see throughout Scripture that the good or the righteous are vexed. It would make sense to have Lot as one of these examples, so we're going to have him first. Lot was, in fact, vexed, tormented, and tested. We see throughout Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, well, specifically that verse, that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was considered very grievous. We note from other passages, such as Genesis chapter 18, verse 32, and Genesis chapter 19, verse 13 and 25, that Sodom and Gomorrah and the the cities round about them did not even have ten righteous people living there. We see in Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 through 11, that the citizens of Sodom attempted to attack Lot's guests. They didn't simply want to get to know them from a hospitable sense. No, there was wickedness involved with that intent. Because of this very grievous sin, and sin similar to it, we find in Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 and 13, the charge that the angels gave. It says, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy excuse me, to destroy it. And then we see Lot's attempt to save his family. Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So we see that both of his sons-in-law refused this request, this stern warning. They weren't concerned about the city being destroyed. In fact, they took Lot as one who was mocking. Now we see also throughout this account 
that even Lot's wife would look back upon the city. She was punished accordingly. Genesis chapter 19, verse 26. We see then that only Lot and his two daughters remained alive after fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah. From our text, we see that Lot himself was tortured on a daily basis due to the continued wickedness displayed by his fellow citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. As a result of this wickedness, these cities were destroyed. And this brought about the deaths of his sons-in-law and eventually the death of his wife. Ultimately, his mettle was tested. He was tortured day in and day out. Day out. He was indeed vexed. He was applied to the touchstone and found faithful. Lot was considered legitimate. Secondly, we consider Job. Job was indeed vexed, tormented, and tested. We see in Job chapter 1, verse 2, that Job had quite a large family. In verse 3, we see that he was very wealthy. And then we see in verses 13 through 19 that Satan would attack him by removing his family and his wealth. They were all destroyed. We see that Job had good health. However, Satan attacked that as well. Job chapter 2 verse 7. It said there that he was in agony due to the severe and sore boils from head to toe. Because of this, he received a strange charge from his wife. Job 2, verses 8 through 10. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. The woman that Job had chosen to help him get to heaven had those words to say to him. No doubt they had good intention. She probably hated to see her husband in this shape. But curse God and die, that's your words of wisdom. But Job refuted her. Then we see that his supposed friends came to attempt and remedy his situation. They mourned with him for almost a week. And then they proceeded to tell him how, how he was wrong. They accused him of sin. And throughout Job chapters 3 through 26, it's basically a form of debate. His friends would accuse him. He would refute them. And it would continue. However, we see in Job chapter 42, verses 7 through 9, that God reproves these three friends. Verse 7, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for he have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite went, and did according as the Lord had commanded them, saying, The Lord also accepted Job. No doubt, when you consider the different things that Job endured, he was indeed tested. He had the touchstone applied to him in his various sufferings. We see that he lost his wealth, his family, and then received accusations from those he would consider friends. I would definitely consider that being vexed. And then we consider the life of Jesus, the very Son of God. Jesus was indeed vexed, tortured, and tormented. 
we see that he gave up all the glory and worship that heaven had to offer. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says that he gave up the form of deity and put on the form of a servant. Then he came to the earth and submitted to the very creation that he had built and made. You think about Jesus as a baby. Mary changed his diapers. As a developing child and young adult, he submitted to the will of his parents. And as is customary in this culture, <clears throat> he went on to learn carpentry as a trade. Now, there's certainly no nothing wrong with trades, but think about carpentry. You're serving everyone else's needs. You had the hard work that nobody else wanted to accomplish. Transpor uh, transporting heavy stones, building great buildings, houses. <laughs> He would also go on to pay his taxes. It's a very un-American thing to say, but he did. And then keep in mind, it was to the very government that would eventually murder him. Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. As he was developing, we see that Jesus was pushed to sin by Satan himself. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11. No doubt he would receive the very worst from the tempter. After all, the Son of God is in the flesh. And if we can cause Jesus to sin, all of humanity will be lost. You could almost see Satan licking his chops, going about as a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yet we know that he was free of all sin. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So not only did he receive all these different types of arrows in the forms of temptation, but I have no doubt that he received the very worst that Satan had to offer. Yet in light of Basanitso, he passed his test. He remained sinless. Now perhaps the most vexing for Jesus, the Son of God, was the cross itself and the events leading up to it. He suffered the betrayal at hands of his apostles. He endured various beatings and mocking. He even endured a mock trial which lasted throughout the night. And eventually he would be put to death on the cross. Now all these different things he endured willingly. Matthew chapter 26 verse 53. And John chapter 10 verses 15 through 18. We'll read verses 17 through 18. Jesus here speaking. Therefore doth my father love me. Because I laid down my life. That I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. You see, Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. He had a will that would permit him to escape that. But he says he laid down his life for us. He chose to do that. Again, applying him to the touchstone. Jesus was indeed found pure, found legitimate. Then we consider how the wicked, the evil are vexed. Might be, an interest, might be an odd thing to think about, but it is indeed true. Consider the ministry of Jesus and all the different demon possessed that he came into contact with. Those demons were afraid of him. Those demons which possessed people knew exactly who Jesus was or is. As the righteous judge, they expected Jesus to torment them. They even requested that they not be tormented before the time. 
And here's our word vexed, tormented. They requested that they not be put to the touchstone before the time. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 29. These demons knew that their reward would be hell. And they knew that it would be after the judgment. And they knew Jesus, the righteous judge, would be the one applying it. Or at least sending them there. Yet they wondered whether or not it might happen sooner. Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils or demons, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Again, that's our word, torment, basanizo. They were expecting Jesus to come torture them before the appointed day. Even now the wicked are being punished in the Hadean realm. Those who have died in rebellion to God are pictured in torment, which is our second word, basanos. We see the, the rich man was in this place, Luke chapter 16, specifically chapter or verse 27 and 28. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, speaking of Abraham, that thou wouldest send me or send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment or basanos. The wicked were being tortured there in the Hadean realm, specifically Tartarus. And obviously this rich man did not want that same uh, future for his family. Next we note that the Christian has the power to vex the wicked. This is done simply by carrying out the very commandments of, of God. By doing so we vex evil. We torture evil. Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Simply doing good to others that hate us, who would consider us our, they're our enemies, doing good to them is the same as heaping coals on their heads. Now we must have the proper motivation in, when, in providing this type of care. We shouldn't be doing it, yep, I'm going to go dump coals on his head. That's not the idea here. The idea is you do right no matter what, no matter who it is, even if it's your enemy. But by doing so, it will be received as hot coals on their head. The other day I was at lunch and there was a coworker of mine that was listening to a, a video. It had to do with the now King Charles and it was a pretty raunchy video. And I had been there for maybe five or ten minutes. He played the video. The video ended. Oh, I didn't see you there, Palooka. I find that very hard to believe considering a person of my stature. But nonetheless, that was his statement. And I said, well, it doesn't make a difference whether I'm here or not. That's between you and God. He said some something that didn't have any bearing on a conversation, and got up and walked out. I know I grate on certain nerves at work because of situations like this. He had nothing else to say, so he got up and walked out. All I did was point out some error. And I can guarantee you everybody else in that room took note. It got quiet after that. 
Then we also vex the, the, those who are evil, the wicked, through our teaching and defending the gospel. This is a necessity. Through the preaching of God's word, we must be vexing the wicked. Part of our Christian walk is to identify and even stop false teachers. 1 John chapter 1 verses or chapter 4 verses 1 through 6. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and that even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In testing these spirits, we will vex them. It has the same effect as that light does on bugs under a stump. All these various insects prefer darkness because it gives them a place to hide. They're comfortable. It might be cool and damp under that stump. When you start showing forth a lot of God's word, you remove that safe hiding spot for them. You remove their spiritual wicked safe space. As Christians doing God's work, we are indeed commissioned to show forth God's light. And in so doing, we will show their evil actions for what they are. And that is abomination before their creator. Our touchstone is the word of God. It is the standard by which we ought to be judging. John chapter 7 verse 24. Matthew chapter 7 verse 20. It is the touchstone by which we gauge the purity levels of not only those who are wicked, but even ourselves and our brethren. Now, how does any of this benefit us today? Well, seeing that vexation occurs regarding those faithful in Scripture, this ought to prepare us. Those who choose to remain faithful have suffered. We've read that. Jesus warned his apostles in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 22. says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me... They will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto the you for my name's sake, because they know, excuse me, not him that sent me. And if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. No cloak for their sin. This concept is seen also in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. As Christians doing the right, we will suffer for it. We will be persecuted. And that's going to have to be something that we learn how to deal with. The reality is, Christians will be vexed by the world simply for being faithful to God. Now this trying of our faith has a good purpose. It brings about patience. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. It teaches us perseverance. Romans chapter 5 verse 3. Every trial that we endure has the possibility, has the potential to make us all stronger. Specifically in how we deal with that type of adversity. 
And they also help us to prepare for similar attacks. After all, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And as we come into contact with them more often, it helps us to be better prepared for the next time. Then we see that trials such as these serve to show our dependence upon God and His Word. After feeding the 5,000, the disciples were told to enter into a ship. There in Mark chapter 6. Dropping down to verse 45, the account goes, And straightway He constrained His disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while He yet sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing. Toiling there is Basanizo. So the waves were so strong that these disciples were tortured. They're put to the touchstone in the sense of rowing takes a lot of work to row a boat, especially when there's a strong headwind against you, especially when the waves are crashing into your vessel. For the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed that it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him... <coughs> And were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. So not only were they troubled by seeing this spirit walking on the water, but they were tortured in the rowing of this ship. Yet when they saw Jesus for who he was, and he explained who he was, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And as soon as he entered into that ship, the wind ceased. Their troubles were over. Now couple this with Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. We see that even though the winds of life can be, and most oftentimes are contrary, God will take care of us. I think oftentimes we lose sight of that. Then, each of these different trials gives us a healthy dose of fear and justice. Fear and justice. We should all fear going to hell. It is the final abode of the wicked, it is torture. And as Christians, we should do everything in our power to escape this place, to avoid being sent there. This is done by being obedient to, to Christ and His gospel. And we also must seek that for others. But we also should want righteous judgment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4-10 through 10. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of righteousness, or excuse me, of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled. Rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Thus these trials show that righteous judgment must be dealt, certainly not by us, and it should give us the fear we need to avoid hell. Now as we wrap this up, 
let us note a few things that we've already discussed. Just as Lot was vexed or tortured daily through the conversation of the wicked, we are as well. We are applied to that touchstone. This should not keep us from doing God's work. Rather, this should, should spur us on. In fact, we should have the same attitude as Peter and the other apostles of Acts chapter 5, verse 41. They rejoiced for being counted worthy to suffer for Christ. They were applied to that touchstone and they were found pure. They were found legitimate. And they were thankful to suffer that persecution. Especially here in, in the United States, we have nothing to compare that with as far as persecution goes. We might get laughed at or poked fun at. They actually endured beatings, true persecutions. Yet they were rejoicing for that, matter, that fact. Suffering for Christ and doing what is right, that is biblically right, ultimately brings heaven. However, unless you're a member of the church that Jesus built, you have no such hope. You have nothing to look forward to when this life in the flesh is over. Because even though you might even be vexed in this life, there is far worse vexing in the world to come. But as Christians, if we're vexed in this life, we have heaven to look forward to, paradise first. If you're not a member of that spiritual body, why not become one today? Faith in Christ as the Son of God, repenting of your past sins, making public confession of Christ, and finally being baptized for the remission of your sins, ultimately makes you a Christian. And at that point, the Lord will add you to His church. However, as a child of God, perhaps you've stumbled in your Christian walk. Why not be restored through repentance and prayer? Harkening back to Basanitso, our word of the morning, the touchstone would determine if one was trying to use legitimate currency or if they were trying to use fool's gold. These two metals look very similar. However, fool's gold is made primarily of iron. A little bit of sulfur in there, which gives it its yellow color. But if this test was applied to you, what would be the result? Would you leave a mark of purity? Would you be found to be pure, legitimate? If not, make the necessary changes this morning as together we stand and sing. <laughs>